Platform Symposium on Universal Health Coverage in the United States, Can We Do It? Um, before we start, I'd like to also let you know that we do have a response panel from 1 to 2.30. Our speaker, today's speaker, will be there. Um, at the end of this response panel, we'll be showing an 11-minute video on um, health care, and the AARP will be sponsoring this. It will be in the bottom after the response panel. Our guest speaker today, who will be addressing the topic of health care costs must we choose who gets medical treatment, is Dr. James M. Nania, MD. Dr. James Nania is the medical director of the Department of Emergency at Deaconess Medical Center. He holds a BS in zoology from the University of Wisconsin and an MD degree from the Loyola Stritch School of Medicine, Illinois. Dr. Nania received an internal medicine internship from St. Francis Hospital in Evanston, Illinois, and an emergency medicine residency from Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. Currently, Dr. Nania serves as chair of the Washington State Governor's Advisory Committee on Trauma. He was appointed by former Governor Booth Gardner and was reappointed by Governor Mike Lowry. Dr. Nania, in addition, is medical advisor to the Lifebird Air Transport and medical program director to Spokane County Emergency Medical Services. He is also chair of Washington State Emergency Medical Services and Trauma Care Steering Committee. Let's welcome da Dr. James Nania to the fourth day of our Popcorn Forum Symposium on Universal Health Care. Thanks a lot, it's great to be here. I have one apology to make. I woke up with laryngitis. <clears throat> it won't bother me, I hope it doesn't bother you too much. I'm grateful to Tony Stewart for the invitation to be here today and uh, for Kaylee for the cough drop she gave me <clears throat> that seems to help a little bit. I'm gonna take some liberty <clears throat> with my topic today. I have to speak from my point of reference, the subject I know, primarily emergency care, I think it relates a great deal and has a lot of relevance, though, to the stated subject of must we choose who gets medical treatment? And I can answer that for you right off the bat. <clears throat> you bet. We already choose. We choose not only by the amount of money we have spent and will spend, but we choose by where that money is targeted on. And the subject I'll speak on most pointedly, injury, and the relative allocation of resource to it relates to the greater issue. Healthcare reform in America isn't just a matter of capping costs and uh, attempting to provide coverage for all Americans. It's a matter also of what kind of systems of critical care and medicine we develop and what kind of research we do and where is the focus. We go without right now <clears throat> many aspects of medical treatment because we focus on other aspects of medical treatment. And that's a conscious choice by our government and by our citizens and by you all. I'd like to start with a historic perspective. <laughs> Gary Larson's helped a lot. Actually, I met him in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. A simple indication that the phylum slendrata also was subject to injury at high speeds, a phenomenon not unique to that genus or phyla, also unique to, uh, also present in man. If you look on the historical perspective, it should provide some relevance to healthcare in America today. Irresponsible mountain goats can cause injury, tossing banana peels where they don't belong. And even kangaroos who are quite agile have trouble on occasion and injury results. Neanderthal. <clears throat> in general, the evolutionary theme of man, whether you're a creationist or an evolutionist, was to abandon a big anatomy and physiology, larger muscle mass, and go on with a more graceful, fragile anatomy with emphasis on our brains, organization, and our creative abilities. So Neanderthal succumbed. He lost out although some of you may have professors who closely resemble that entity. We all have to work with a few of them. But our ability to reason, to pick and choose our battles, to recognize when we're outclassed, is a big part of what made the species so successful in populating the globe. So therefore, as men advanced, <clears throat> we became more hairless, and proceeded on our intellectual ability, so too did Mother Nature chase us, and this is an actual recreation of a real event, 
when one of our Australopithecine ancestors fell prey to the beasts. Natural disasters such as earthquakes took significant life loss historically, probably, but population densities were low. Therefore, an entire town being leveled in an earthquake is not the magnitude of a possible today disaster because rather than a million people, they may have been 25 or 50 and they lived in single story dwellings. But as they concentrated more in cities, <clears throat> volcanic eruptions such as that that hit Herculaneum could result in a significant loss of life as evidenced by the archeologic record. But man got injured, the contributors to mortality for our species have been significantly injury. Olduvai Gorge is now a major valley and an archeologic site, even as a pothole that probably claimed a few victims. And then our technology gets us in trouble. In this uh, rendering, Garf didn't know his club was loaded, and hence injury resulted. <laughs> Trick clubbing expeditions sometimes probably went awry, and people were injured. Likewise, school pranks back in the BC years have been far more injurious than the ones you may play today on your teachers. And joyriding is not a phenomenon new to our youth, but in prehistoric times, injuries may have resulted from pack term rides. And practical jokes. We still get, get, we can get away with this in Spokane every year. They never catch on. Funny, yes, but injury. Even though our species faced a significant mortality from infectious disease, and in the undeveloped, more or less developed parts of the world still does, I think you probably know that diarrheal illness, in other words, diarrhea causing dehydration is the greatest killer in the world because of a lack of ability to treat it with intravenous fluids and just supportive care. Self-limited illnesses that'll go away in seven days can kill you if you get too dehydrated. Well, America has lots of ability to treat that, and it's not a major contributor to death in US of A. Injury has become a major contributor to death in US of A, disproportionate to many less developed nations. But whatever affected our species in its four million years of evolution or its seven days, the fact is we succeeded greatly and our population has taken off on the globe. Almost five billion humanoids now live on the earth. An interesting note is this is, this is the curve of population growth. <clears throat> if you drop two cozy bacteria on a petri dish with a nice nutrient broth, they will reproduce in the same pattern and from an arithmetic phase of growth as they get closer to one another and more familiar perhaps and have worked on utilizing their environment they accelerate their growth phase to a logarithmic phase of growth and that's where we are as humans in the darker orange brown area and if we follow the bacteria after this accelerated phase of growth what happens is the finite resources of your culture dish and or earth are depleted and you pollute your environment and the plateaus off or population levels off and if the pollution is too excessive, the culture plate itself extinguishes the species it initially nurtured. Are we smart enough to avoid that? Concentration of our population in cities became a phenomenon as man got more organized. The division of labor the grid, some people doing energy, some people raising food, some people providing government, some people providing armies. The division and complexity of our society allowed many thousands to live in small areas. And again, when natural disaster or human created fires affected those areas, now the loss of a whole city could involve tens of thousands of individuals. But perhaps more than anything, our technology in, in view of the fact we could not compete with our animals by virtue of muscle mass, teeth, or nails, we could make them. These are Clovis points from Washington State, 10,000 years old. Really beautiful, fairly simple, but effective in hunting and gathering. In this cave painting from southern France, 20,000 BC, you'll see that we weren't always successful even though we had a spear. Although if you look closely up here, death by this European bison may not have been an entirely unpleasant experience. 
It's hard to interpret these cave paintings sometimes, but medically that can be a sign of spinal injury, by the way. And although they're primitive, properly placed to spiral, do you? And this is a primitive college student telling a primitive professor and physician to get off their ass and do something about death and disability in their homeland. Someone's got to tell us. Think of what this meant to the species in death and what kind of resources maybe primitive man applied to medical care. When they developed the bow and arrow, now you could hurt someone without confronting them. You know, throw a shell of arrows into the air towards an enemy from 50 or 100 feet away at very little risk to you, but certain risk to those people you could shoot if you got to be a good aim. And so I imagine thousands of years ago, the tribal medicine man began to get proficient or learn skills to deal with penetrating injury, self-inflicted. And that's the dark side of health care for our species, is that much of what we have to deal with or have had to deal with historically is self-inflicted injury, humanoids against humanoids. Early development of flamethrowers. The Phoenicians stormed into, into port ready to kick ass on the uh, Greeks and they torched their ships with a primitive flamethrower that nonetheless devastated their fleet. But this, more than any other technological development, greatly magnified the death and disability rates for our species, and obviously the subsequent allocation of resource and interest in technology and development of treatment, the ability to contain explosion and hurl projectiles with great force. That and all its forms are still with us today. It's actually in the military sector in my business that all the contemporary terms, ambulance, triage, medic, were developed. When we began to get into mass conflict, tens of thousands against tens of thousands, we began to recognize the need to treat those casualties. I mean, they often weren't treated. And simple wounds we could easily treat today could often be lethal back then. But the need for rapid treatment, control of blood loss, and the treatment of wounds was clearly developed in the military theater. In the Civil War, an early goal of the both Union and Confederate generals in charge of medical care was to try to evacuate all the wounded within 24 hours from the battlefield. That meant a lot of people died, but their focus back then had to be as it was on the sacrifice of limb to preserve life, because if you were gut shot, you died. If you were chest shot, you either died or lived in, in spite of care in general. And like today, if you were shot in the head, you died in general. And more contemporarily in the military theater, we perfected some of the early principles regarding the treatment of injury. MASH, great show. It probably has a resurgence every year on the college campus. I watched every episode three times in college. In any event, the principles of evacuation of wounded and rapid treatment and stabilization were well identified in the Korean conflict and further applied in Vietnam where there was greater training of the medics and the ability to treat patients during transport. And we needed to do so because those jungle warriors who had bows and arrows could only maybe fire a few shots in a minute, now have AK-47s, and can do things like the thug whose name is Pol Pot in Cambodia, who snuffed about a million of his people for grins. And more recently in the Middle East, our technology has simply mushroomed. Anyone can get a weapon to knock down a $60 million airplane. Military history then for injury. Injury became a major factor affecting the health of our species. A major allocation of resource to the treatment of injury occurred in the military sector. Okay. We know what America has spent on arms, and part of it what it has spent on the military system and for the care of the injured. Fortunately, we're not in a major conflict right now, and you and I living in this beautiful area aren't faced with a daily confrontation in a military sense. And yet, because of our technology, the disease that is injury has mushroomed and become an epidemic of unprecedented proportions. 
And will you hear about that elsewhere this week? Will you be exposed to that? Will the question be asked why we aren't spending more on what by any measure is an epidemic? At least today it will. Inherently dangerous. Remember our fragile anatomies. We did not have time to biologically evolve airbags on our chests and helmets on our heads. I got here this way. I was delighted because the speed limit is 65 between Liberty Lake where I live and here. We are not built to handle stops at 65 miles an hour. We need to make the vehicle safer. I'm sure many of you got here today in one of these. But when we routinely, our common mode of transportation puts us at 60 miles per hour, things happen. Mechanical failures, errors in judgment, and significant injury results. On our highways alone, we kill, and no one thinks it's for a worthwhile cause, 50,000 people a year. Simple falls. You wouldn't think about it, but we have a lot of ladders now. We have a lot of platforms to work on. We do a lot of bridge building, building building, simple roofing of houses. The fact is our technology in modern society has created a lot more relief to our topography than existed in much of man's natural environment. And the result is people fall and they sustain mortal injury. If you fall more than 15 feet, you got a very good chance of being seriously broken and sometimes in killed. Of course, falls can sometimes result from practical jokes. You guys wouldn't do this, would you? And agriculture and our occupations, our technology in the workplace, Think of all the machines you're exposed to on a daily basis or in the workplace that have the potential for some serious injury that were never in existence even 100 years ago. Wonderfully efficient, made America the nation to feed much of the world, but the fact is these things are dangerous and injuries result with the complex technology at use in our workplace. And then America's love affair with weapons. I'm sure you heard about this yesterday, violence in America, and it's worth spending a little time at. 200 million guns in the hands of our citizens, not counting our army. More guns in the hands of our citizens than many nations have in the hands of their army. I grew up with guns. I have guns, I like guns. But the fact is, if you've got a lot of these around, bad things happen, people get hurt. And the absurdity of the situation is that all these non-sporting weapons are widely available in certain sets of our country, areas of our country, and parts of our population. And we have to start beginning to get afraid of it. And yet it's a political issue too because it's big business, of course. Sure, it's part of the American fabric. But you know what? There's much more violence today in LA, in Seattle, in Tacoma, than there ever was in the Old West. The mythology of the gunslinger is part of our heritage. There's some truth to it. But people were safer in the small towns in terms, of, in terms of guns than they are today in the large cities of America. Violence such as we're seeing now has never been part of our heritage until recently. And then I hope you heard this yesterday, but America is number one by a tremendous margin in the number of young men we kill every year from weapons. Murder alone, measured by traditional medical standards, is an epidemic. Murder alone. And murder alone is only a contributor to major injury that is the most neglected disease that we must put resource to apply, that we can afford to put resource to in America. Untold billions. Conservative estimate of the cost of gun violence alone, $35 billion a year. Yes, we gotta preserve the right to bear arms, but probably we gotta be sensible about it and look at the price take and make the decision in an informed fashion. You may again have heard about this yesterday, but we can estimate the cost for a single firearms injury depending on the severity of the injury, anywhere from ten to $30,000. And then the most tragic aspect of guns in our society, 
is that they're spilling over to our youth. Even in little old Spokaloo, guns have shown up in the grade schools. Some of it's fashion, you know, why you just now dress with baggy pants and let your undies show out the back. But part of it is that when these things are around and in the schools, they go off and people get hurt. This is a part of growing up that's not our historic, our heritage. EMS journals, emergency medical services journals, I peruse, now are featuring flak vests for paramedics. And this is how we have fun in America. We do things like this. Some of you probably did that this year, I did. And we do that. And the snowboarders have really taken off, and we do this. This is an extreme example. And most regrettably, we do this. I like the winter a lot. Uh, we had a lousy winter, not much snow. But uh, next time you have a big dump of snow, if you're here, read the local paper and get a copy of the Spokane paper. And you will find that if we get a big snowfall before the weekend, that weekend we will kill a child on our sledding hills and we will permanently disable another. The disability is going to cost everyone because it's a child and no one has adequate insurance to cover that prolonged disability. Significant disability can cost all of us through tax contributions up to $400,000 a year per injury, per year, every year. Naked head syndrome. This is not a natural homo sapiens activity. We need protection, we are too fragile. Helmets are not just for motorcycles and bicycles. They are for recreational sports that can result in death from head injury as well. And the beast get in a few legs. I love to backpack. But heck, someone gets eaten every year in Glacier, and I'm afraid to go there now. But it's not a major contributor to death by violence or injury in our society now. And in other parts of the world, occasionally a rogue elephant gets a few people. And some things, what can you do about it? No, I mean, we'll talk about prevention, but <clears throat> he's happy. See, that's part of the problem. The guy's happy about being in the paper about this. And sometimes we all make mistakes. Even us doctors make mistakes. In this case, Ted thought he was putting on the headphones and dropped the wings off the airplane. <laughs> Humans make errors behind the wheel in other places and that results in significant injury. And even science can go awry. In this case, Professor Waxman's attempt at rectal temperatures on large reptiles resulted in significant injury. <laughs> and mass disaster still strikes the US of A. So severe can it be that it will even affect aliens in some cases, although this top secret photo was suppressed by the government for fear of freaking out the population. <laughs> but suffice it to say, Hurricane Andrew, volcanic eruptions in our area, significant earthquakes in our area when they strike major population centers can result in thousands of casualties. So we have dangerous modes of transportation we have a dangerous workplace, lots of technology. We have created artificially lots of elevations that we fall off of. And when we play, we play often in a dangerous way considering our fragile anatomy. And then, and we shoot ourselves up, this. America consciously chooses to endorse an intoxicating, addicting substance as okay. That's a choice. Must we choose who gets medical treatment? It very much relates to, shall we select and what drugs shall we select to be allowed in our society and widely celebrated and advertised? I am not a teetotaler. I like to have a rum every night I can. But I am blessed by not having alcoholism, by inheritance, or in most cases it's a disease. But the fact of the matter is, is if your culture has dangerous transportation, workplace technology and recreation and a lot of weapons and then you sprinkle into that dangerous modern environment an intoxicant that impairs judgment and coordination you are fertilizing the grim reaper's garden in injury mushrooms and you have now not just a little epidemic but a big epidemic 
And it looketh the perfect celebration. Don't get me wrong, I learned to drink behind the wheel. We couldn't, um, when we were experimenting with alcohol in high school, you couldn't go drink at anyone's house. So we you know, I had a friend who had a beard who looked like he was 18, and he'd buy a beer at the 7-Eleven, and we'd go drive around and throw the beer cans out the window. It was great fun. Fortunately, he was a good driver. Fortunately, I didn't get nailed. Model of perfection, right? The perfect tan. Greatest ads in the journals. Canada at its best. Canadian best. Who hasn't been enticed from time to time onto the rocks of life by a stiff belt or two? The result of this modern society is an epidemic. The fact that this is epidemic is a tragedy because much of it's preventable, much of it, if it occurs, is treatable, and yet relative to must we choose, we today choose to accept a death toll on our highways alone that is nearly twice the total Vietnam conflict put together every year. And yet, where is the protest? Are you guys protesting this? The leading cause of death for most of you here is going to be, as you approach these years, injury. And yet you are not the enfranchised. You are not the board of bank directors. You are not the administrators of the hospital. You are not the community leaders in many cases yet. And for some reason, the resource in America has gone disproportionately to the diseases that affect those groups and not our youth. The number one cause of death of children is injury. It equals, exceeds all the other causes of death of children put together. Is that the subject of a national telephone? Is there a hue and cry? Are we burning the midnight oil because of that? I don't think so. Not now. 140,000 deaths annually. The non-fatal injuries accrue all kinds of costs, and the total costs now are estimated at $157 billion a year. You want to have enough money to treat everything and do every test on anybody? Stop this. This is wasted money. No one thinks it's cool. And yet it occurs because of a lack of citizen responsibility, of medical community responsibility, to insist that there is a rational application of dollars in your society to the diseases that affect it the greatest. We all pay, you know, part of what workers get paid and what they don't get paid and what's withheld from their paycheck is to cover the disability that results when they simply miss years of uh, future work. Spinal cord injury, quadriplegia or paraplegia, 6,000 a year. Multiply that times a third of a million dollars a year in terms of medical costs for a lifetime that may yet go another 40 years. Brain injuries that many people never okay, they all pay for that. And on the receiving end, as, and I'm just a working emergency guy, we get this stuff. And we have to do this stuff on occasion. And that was once a vital anatomic part of an individual. So, epidemic affects our youth, slays our children. And yet, and if you look at it in terms of years of life lost, you know, one thing you may not hear about, I hope you'll read that little one-pager by George F. Will, who's a conservative son of a gun but sometimes writes brilliant stuff, uh, facing the skull beneath the skin of life. It's on the back there. What he's talking about is we aren't celebrating the fact that in general, humans live twice as long now as they did for the vast majority of their existence. In the last 100 years, the lifespan of our species has doubled. It's a miracle. And much of the healthcare dilemma we're in now relates to the fact that as we have an increasingly older population, much of the healthcare dollar goes to treat conditions that occur very late in life. There is money to do that. Everyone deserves to live as long as they can in my book. Let Allah sort them out. We have resource to treat them, but we don't have infinite bucks, and we've got to focus our efforts on the things we can deal with the greatest. I want to go back to this, because look where we put our resource, consciously, through the 
geopolitical process in the United States of America. Years of life lost because injury hits the young exceeds the can total of cancer and heart disease put together. Diseases acquired later in life beyond, in some sense, the natural lifespan of man. Great chance of curing many cancers, thank goodness, in the next decade and in preventing heart disease because of that application of resource, but a continuing acceptance of mega casualties for our youth, our middle-aged, and increasingly our elderly who have become increasingly the victims of major injury. And then look where we spend our money. Take someone who didn't know squat about healthcare and say, Martian bozo, here's a species here. They got some diseases. Here's X amount of dollars. Spend it where it will do the most good. He wouldn't do this. He'd say, oh, well, you know, can't let children die. They should live another 40 years, especially if it's preventable stuff and cheap to fix. But that's the nature of our society. And if you look statistically, and they do this on every couple of your bases at the CDC, look at what's snuffing our species. This is what makes sense to do. On the other hand, politics enters into it. And I believe in the American political system, and it's a matter of advocacy and you know each citizen's responsibility to speak up. It's what democracies, even representative ones, are based on. Because of effective advocacy on the part of gay activists, they have been able to direct an incredible amount of resource on a disease that affects perhaps all of us or me and is appropriately termed an epidemic because it is and deserves this kind of allocation of resource. I say, you bet it does. But whereas injury, because it doesn't have an organized constituency and advocacy and affects mostly children and young adults, has not been able to get that kind of resource, by virtue of organization and enhanced description of this disease, a significant amount of resource has gone into trying to find a cure for HIV infection, AIDS syndrome, and premature death from that. I'm all in favor of this. But the fact they've succeeded, and we have it with other diseases in our society, should ring a bell in our heads. And then, do we have enough money? Well, let's look at the cost of a cure and compare it. And in perspective, every year in the United States of America, up till the last stats I had were two years ago, we rack up more deaths from injury than the total number of deaths from AIDS when they started keeping track in 1984. This is what we have to do. Measure what it costs to affect a cure or effective treatment or provide quality years of life. Put a pencil to it and make conscious decisions where we're going to put our resource. If we're looking at the application of resource in healthcare alone. Regarding injury, we don't need a new vaccine. We don't need basic research. The problem is that if you're going to get snuffed, and regrettably, that's how some of you are going to die, by injury, if you get badly hurt, a lot of people die within an hour or two. And they die from major injury that we can't fix. The brain has got too many wires and too much like a bowl full of jelly. Smash it bad and ain't nobody who can fix it yet. Not that there is an effective treatment for some kinds of head injury, but the devastating ones I will receive this spring, and on an annual basis quite a few, you can't fix. You've got to prevent them. We choose not to adequately fund the programs of prevention. We choose not to legislate prevention, and we accept half the deaths of injury, 70,000 a year, which can only be prevented and for which there's no medical effective treatment. The next big group of people die within hours because they don't get adequate treatment in time. They lose blood and we don't have a good blood replacement. And we don't have people readily available to stop hemorrhage in an adequate time frame to save a life. And we don't have people readily available to breathe for the patient until the patient can breathe for themselves. The lack of funding of citizen capability in terms of treating major injury, the lack of emphasis in our school curriculum is one of the reasons lots of these people die. 
you would think that instead of African geography in fifth grade, which has changed a lot since I learned it, and is changing again now, we might teach every son of a gun in our nation how to control bleeding. CPR has been widely taught, and that's part of the theme of CPR. Every citizen must be responsible for at least some ability regarding their immediate health care. But the fact is still, it's a negligible part of most curriculum, and we do not focus on an area where it can even be more effective, the control of hemorrhage, the provision of other means of breathing. If we were rationally applying health care resource, you might be required or strongly encouraged, at least in high school and perhaps in college, to be able to save your friend or family member's life for the things that you can do that for immediately. And the lack of the development of trauma centers in the United States of America and systems to deal with these things in a time-critical framework is one of the big reasons why we lose people we could save once they are injured. This stuff will give you a headache. I think we go on to the next carousel now, if you would. And being an emergency guy, one of the benefits of my business is that I work long and hard hours, but I get to leave town more frequently than many people. And when I leave town, see, belts are boring. I'm not going to emphasize it. But the fact is, our use in Washington State in your area is about 75%. And that's ridiculous. When your body hasn't got thick armor on, you've got to secure yourself to take advantage of the armor of the vehicle you are driving. One gets used to it. And the fact of the matter is many, much of our current death and disability in the highway still relates to the lack of adequate restraints, the lack of helmets in our children and our adults. We choose in our urban areas to fund through levies of the citizens paramedic programs that provide excellent emergency medical care within minutes. We choose by virtue of a lack of funding not to have that capability available in our rural areas. It's surprising for many politicians and citizens to learn that if you get smacked 50 miles north of here, the emergency medical person who shows up to treat you most likely will not be able to give you an intravenous, okay, an IV to give you life-saving fluids will not be able to provide for you definitive airway care because that is beyond the scope of their training. Because as a society, we do not choose to pay for that training and see that that ability is widely available outside our major urban areas. The simple safe use of this drug, if you have a reaction to an animal, a bee sting, can be life-saving. It is not a training capable capability given by training to the most common form of emergency medical services provider in Washington State or Idaho because we don't have the resource or choose not to apply it. Communications, E911, 911 systems have mushroomed. But the fact of the matter exists in much of Idaho and Washington State and Montana, the emergency medical person at the scene does not have the capability because of a lack of technology available to him to talk to the hospital until he gets close. You probably read it in the papers recently about the plan with Ted Turner and someone else for a global network of $860 million satellites around the earth. The military can talk to anybody anytime. So can the government any place in the globe virtually. People trying to save a citizen's individual life do not have that capability because we do not choose to put the resource to it. Emergency departments, although increased uh, capability has been the uh, recent trend in many cases, the ability, availability of experts to staff them is limited because of inadequate medical training in many areas. And CAT scanning, okay? <laughs> we may have to use a more primitive technique with healthcare reform, but one of the waves of the future provided there's money to fund it, is for enhanced ability to image. I can't go into this a lot, but where we now have a machine that looks inside humans without cutting them, even when I started practice, 
we often had to cut them to see what was wrong. And sometimes it turned out they weren't hurt or weren't sick. Now we can look inside without cutting on them and in many cases get just as accurate a picture and that is a great ability. If you are hurt today going home, will there be an operating room ready for you? No guarantee any place in the Inland Empire. They may all be busy. They'll get to you, but you will wait. And if you remember that graph, as the Grim Reaper's clock runs, time might run out on you. Why? Because we do not apply adequate resource, choose not to, to guarantee availability of an OR or specially trained people, such as trauma surgeons, to treat you. Every significant hospital in our area has a coronary care unit, a CCU. A hospital over 50 beds has a CCU. Not one hospital in Eastern Washington or the Inland Empire has a shock trauma unit with a similar degree of expertise and training to treat major injury. That expertise does not exist because we have chosen not to apply resource to it. And finally, the ability to repair someone who's been damaged. Other countries with less resource than America do a better job at returning people to work sooner with a better quality of life than America does because we have, not, we have chosen not to adequately fund rehabilitation. As I said, this stuff can bum you out. So after a busy year last year, I decided to go to the Rose Bowl, University of Wisconsin. I went there three years, we didn't win a game. We still went to the games all the time and had wild parties at the games and afterwards. But after 31 years, the Badgers got back to the Rose Bowl when their first one, and it was a great party. But it reminded me that four weeks earlier, at a significant victory in my hometown, there was a mass stampede. And dozens of people nearly lost their life, and many were significantly hurt because of the unnatural <coughs> phenomena of accumulating 75,000 rabid fans in a small area and to try and tear down the goalposts. So I came back and just looked at the headlines in the paper for the few days we were gone. And this is how we started the uh, new year in the Spokane area. Check the paper almost any day. Random violence. Problem with bullets is once they're out of the gun, they go kind of any place. I was pleased to see they set up a death clock in New York to keep track of how many people get killed by guns a year in, in uh, the United States. Third day after it was set up, they shot out the D. So I needed another vacation. Wasn't ready yet. You ever go on vacation and come back needing another one? It happens a lot. So I went to beautiful Montana, just down the road, but I found that they got problems too. This is how they hunt for geese in Montana. No seat belt, the back end of a moving pickup. It's effective, but dangerous. Low water fishing using wheelbarrows, dangerous. Grizzly bear art artificial insemination team, a worthwhile <laughs> occupation, but hazardous. Guys get in trouble attempting various techniques. And their recreation in Montana is like any place, except they're more macho boulder surfing. A lot of injuries result, and their attempt at an Olympic uphill bobsled team was short-lived and resulted in significant injuries. And again, occupational activities in Montana can result in severe injuries, such as twisted necks from this kind of flying. But they've made some progress. They're not done there. Prevention. When the ice melts, that guy's going to be okay. And their designated driver program is a real credit to the state of Montana. We ought to take a clue from them and do something like this ourselves. Well, a quick pit stop and back home to Washington State. A few of our particulars, the story is no different here, and I can generalize this to the end of the empire and I hope panhandle. This disease is not just an American problem, it's a problem in the Northwest. And the economics are outrageous. The cost in Washington State, I don't have Idaho figures, for the immediate medical cost per year, now $300 million. Must we choose? When you blow money on stuff you don't have to, you bet you gotta start choosing. And you are choosing not to spend that money elsewhere. 
the total cost, you know, Washington state government was in trouble a year ago with a billion dollar deficit. Total cost per year of injury largely preventable and very treatable, one billion dollars. Hemorrhage of resource. And we did a significant study involving a fair number of patients from the Idaho Panhandle that showed that the mortality in Washington state for an injury was worse than the national average of organized systems of injury care and significantly worse than this in some states that have done more to organize it. What are the obstacles we face in health care reform in choosing, if we have to choose, who gets medical treatment? Ignorance is the big one. We simply need to know the facts. The decisions should be based on facts. What are the diseases? How effective is the treatment is? What is the result in terms of quality years of life? And how much money you're willing to spend? The facts are easy to sort out by college students in one hour in the afternoon, given adequate information. And the fear of change. One thing I have learned as I get older, I didn't know this when I was in college protesting and having a good time, was that change is hard the older you get. There's a lot of momentum in having done things the same way, even if you don't like how you're doing them. It's a lot easier than change and less scary. And apathy. Heck, you aren't protesting 50,000 highway deaths a year in the United States of America. When I was in college, we weren't protesting a Vietnam a year on my, our highways. We were protesting a war. Why the difference in focus? No one thinks that the lives lost in our highways is a good idea. And then there's some prejudice involved here too. Just another dirt ball. Guy was drunk. Stupid lady turned right, should have gone left. Just another drug dealing son of a gun does the world a favor that he's dead. There's a lot of prejudice about treating injury patients, and that's a reason why we don't apply adequate resource to it. And in all the committee processes that we've been involved with in Washington State, not once have we had an eight-year-old at the table <coughs> who would raise their hand and say, this is what's snuffing kids. I want you to do something about it. Invested adults seem to try to make their medical systems deal with the problems that affect them the greatest. But from the front lines of medicine after a fashion, I need to give you this perspective on health care. We did that. I was old enough to remember that. Many of you may not have been. We more recently put the Hubble Bubble Telescope in space. One billion dollars and it was blind. The corrective lenses were another $500 million. America chooses to do that. Talk about do we have enough money to treat people? Sure we do, if we choose not to spend it on other things. I like our space program. There's a lot of spin-off technology. But think about an individual patient who may not live because they didn't get adequate emergency medical care, who's a child, and ask that family if it was worth it, if with that same amount of money we could have provided life-saving care in town. We make the choice. We have to be willing to not duplicate resources all over the place, to think about what we're doing, and to adequately pay for it if we want to get effective about health care. We need to ask not just is it neat, but does it work, and does it have an effect on human lives? We must educate ourselves, as one of my heroes, the former heavyweight champ, Larry Holmes, did, and study the facts on health care and be willing to go forward, as my television heroes did, with a new direction. A lot of it comes down to bucks. But if this week all you hear about is that America is blowing 12% of its gross national product on health care, and how do we stop that, they got gotcha. you. Because you need to know where that 12% fits in the overall scheme of what we blow our money on in terms of space, in terms of our military, in terms of our government, in terms of a country that spends $8 billion a year on pet food. Those are conscious decisions we make. And believe me, when illness or injury affects you or your family, those questions will come to mind. And you will ask why. Because. Whatever else, 
These are the faces behind the major advances in medicine any place in the world. We gotta get our head out of the clouds as physicians. This is absolutely true in all its forms. And even if we make that body immortal and do a genetic programming or engineering where the body will repair itself and not age, and that may be possible, who knows? It'll still get injured and will still be in a time critical race for its life. And therefore, investment in injury care is a long-term blue chip healthcare investment that we have yet to make significantly. If disease in a traditional sense, like an infection, were killing our youth, like injury is, this auditorium would be full every week of people working within their communities to do something about it. Are we gonna continue to bend over and take it in the shorts? Or are we going to attempt to achieve peak performance with whatever medical care system we have? To do that, we have to focus on the most significant causes. Will the trauma center be open? Or will the doors be closed because they're busy? Because it wasn't worth it to have another OR and another surgeon standing by. And result, little kids like Kaylee. And whatever you say about other victims of injury, and as much as I think it's worth treating anyone of any age if there's a chance of years of quality life left, the fact of the matter is, our most innocent and deserving victims are our children. And any medical care system and any choice regarding medical treatment in a healthy society needs to focus on that. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't believe we'll be doing any questions right now because of this voice, but if you would all like to attend the response panel at one o'clock, please you're all more than welcome. Thank you.